like to call to order the <laughs> May 18, 2023 meeting of the Land Use Advisory Committee. Uh, we have an agenda. If there are no concerns with that agenda, we'll consider it approved. Motion to approve. We don't need to vote on it, Terry. That's okay. But thank you. Uh -huh. We don't have to vote on the agenda. Don't as long vote. as nobody hates it, we're okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but we do have to vote on the January 19th, 2023 Land Use Advisory Committee minutes. Would somebody like to make a motion? Go ahead. I'll make the motion to approve. Thank I'll you. second you. Thank you, Phil. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. We have minutes. Yay. Hi, you're up. Uh, um, do we have a presentation on the computer? Um, oh, great. Thank you for the, the invitation to be here. I'm, uh, I'm Todd Graham. I'm a principal forecaster and economist at Metropolitan Council. Uh, Dennis Farmer is a planning analyst in transportation services. He's, uh, he's with me if there are tough questions that I can answer. And our, uh, you know, by way of introduction, our main project, Dennis and mine, uh, for the past decade and, and still today has been uh, renovating and advancing our forecast practice at Met Council and implementing methods and techniques with a goal of better forecasts. So I'm going to talk with you today about local forecasts, which is one of the things that we've got coming up in the, uh, in the something that we'll be working on for the next, let's say, 18 months. Um, so this presentation is a review of it's a review, very quickly, of why and how we forecast in the Metro Twin Cities. Then a few findings from the region level forecast that we presented last month to uh, Committee of the Whole at Met Council. And finally, how this fits with the planning cycle writ large. And um, I think we have time at the end for discussion. Is that the, the committee's uh, interest? Do you want to have discussion of this? toward the end? It makes no difference to okay. me. Whatever works for you is fine. Okay. So jumping in, why and how we forecast. Great. Net Council is a planning agency, and regional planning is a forward-looking enterprise. Any good plan is going to include expectations about the future, about the conditions related to our planning. So our forecast team uh, is called on to answer where and when and how much growth is expected. Um, and this work matters in this region, the Twin Cities, because both Met Council and local governments uh, involved in planning have expectations of uh, a, a concurrency expectation. Regional and local planners are planning for the same future. And that really is the path to, uh, to, to, to planning success. The metro region has grown over the course of decades and will continue to grow. And my team's part in this is using spatial analysis and our understanding of regional and economic dynamics to forecast where, how much growth is most likely. Okay. Um, you know, there is a, a tension in this before I move on to the next slide what policies should be brought into that model scape, what policies are included in our assumptions about the future. And in the planning cycle that's just now underway, planning for 2050, we expect most net council policies remain. I don't know if there will be new policies. Uh, really, that's why this spring, council staff have been speaking with committees and advisory committees, uh, this one, um, this may be the third time Chair Wolf has heard this presentation. Ideally, uh, our council decision makers, with your advice, are going to make some decisions this year about what assumptions they would like to lock in, uh, what policies need to be represented somehow in our forecast process. Uh, the local context mirrors the regional context. We have forecasts in part to facilitate this concurrency in, 
in uh, expectations about the future. Uh, the conflicts where they sometimes arise are, are uh, arise with specific local governments, are conflicts about the specific numbers, specific places. Uh, we are open to cities making a case for alternative assumptions or an alternative future, but it has to be a real case with real likelihood. Uh, and we ask that you, you show us, uh, if, if you're with a city government, we ask that you show us what you've got in terms of uh, development expectations and, and plans. And I'll circle back to this at the end of the presentation. So let's get into how we forecast. Well, we, we, use, uh, we use models. There's not a crystal ball about the future. There's, uh, there's instead math. Real world systems are being reduced in the model space to just the key behaviors and interactions. And this gives us a platform for experimenting with, uh, with the big picture, speeding up the course of what we expect to have happen in a mathematical framework. And um, you know all the, all the things that we would consider to be questions about how our region develops are being represented by formulas and parameter settings and variables. Uh, those variables are usually time and place specific variables. Like for example, um, how much employment is at a given place in the region. So the state of the practice, uh, this is a little bit about how not just Met Council, but Metro planning agencies typically are doing this work. The state of the practice has been to break up and compartmentalize the, the couple of problems that, that need to be solved by models. And multiple models is, is a, you know, a, a strategy that we've, we and other peer agencies, other major metros have settled on uh, for well, making these models practical, because there's not one big Uber model that can do everything. So on the uh, <clears throat> second floor upstairs, we have several models we operate, and I'm just going to discuss three of these. One is uh, a regional economic model for forecasting region-level economic activity and migration flows and population. From that, we get what are the regional totals going to be. In the middle of this slide, we have a, a land use model for allocating future land use to specific places. We expect there to be 650,000 population growth. That growth is going to happen in specific places. So that's the, the middle model here. And then finally, our, our travel demand model, the last box on this slide, uh, receives that geographic distribution of where people are, where jobs are, um, where other attractors are, things that people want to travel to. And, and uh, in the travel demand model, we are predicting where people want to go, how they get there, and resulting network conditions. Yeah. Dennis could talk about that for a half hour, but we'll come back to that. So this was designed to be quick. I wanted to get into what we've got as a region level forecast results. Because last, last month, uh, beginning of April, um, I've got a few slides that are excerpted from a presentation to our council members. Uh, we have refreshed the macro level modeling that we do, what I described as the region level model. And um, in that region level model, we're looking at what's expected for the region, the state, the nation, and the results seem to me, uh, having done this a couple of cycles now, very different from any of the regional forecasts that came before year 2020. Um, 2020, several things upended all of the time series, all of our expectations. We're living in a different world now. So these are uh, on screen a few, just a few takeaways from the regional forecast, and then I've got a. a four or five slides illustrating these. We are facing a changed geoeconomic situation. Uh, we're facing a 20 years workforce shortage and an economic slowdown because of the first two things. Uh, second bullet, population growth <clears throat> has slowed for every reason you can imagine. I'll get into that about two slides from now. 
And third, something we already knew, uh, aging of the population continues on its, on its glacial and unstoppable path. This is something that we knew before, that we're all aging. Um, the population is growing older. Um, that's probably the one bullet on here that you would, you would have seen in the presentations I was giving four, six, eight years ago. I am not aging. No, no, you and I look good. <laughs> We, we, do, uh, we do have a new normal, a, a new uneasy, unstable normal. We're living through what I've called a, a reset of the region's economy. And, you know, that's a, a fact for metros across the country. We're not alone in this. Uh, during this decade and the next, we expect we'll be seeing lower growth rates than maybe we were historically accustomed to. Um, you know, the Twin Cities metro gained a lot of economic activity and jobs in the 1990s, and then again in the 2010s. In the 2010s, the decade that ended with the pandemic, uh, we probably gained 200,000 jobs. In most industries, uh, including manufacturing and construction and wholesale and transportation, they have regained all that they lost during the pandemic and the post-pandemic uh, recovery. We are, let's say, back to where we were in those industries at the end of 2019. Um, manufacturing, construction, wholesale trade, transportation. We're back to something like normal with those. The exceptions are, the exceptions where we have not regained our previous high point are things like retail services, service sectors, hotels, entertainment, all of those were hit very hard. I think what all of you recognize, all of those have in common is that they are high-touch, in-person uh, industries that people uh, shied away from during the pandemic for public health reasons, and they have not really come back yet. Another reason for the slowing employment growth is on the, let's call it the supply side. We're approaching now a point where workforce participation is gonna hit a ceiling uh, you'll hear people say almost everyone who could be working is, almost. And I think once we reach that ceiling, if we do, then employment growth is, is, uh, is sort of bound, limited, because there's not more people coming. This is both an economic, a workforce, and a population issue. So we are expecting uh, this decade and the next uh, that employment growth slows to about 5% per decade. <coughs> um, and 4 or 5% per decade is less than the 20-year average. It's considerably less than, than uh, before the pandemic. And that, uh, you know, in preparing this forecast, I, I consulted, traded notes with the state economist's office. Independently, they, they only really forecast out to 2035, but they came up with the same results. Um, from a different model. They don't use the same model we do. And the consensus is that both Minnesota and Twin Cities are, um, we are at the start of this decade of low growth, historically low growth, because of population. So let's, uh, let's take a look at, next slide, let's look at that, population growth. Total population of the metro, uh, we expect to reach 3.82 million in 2050, which, both seems like a lot and maybe not so much because it's not the growth rate trajectory that we were on. You can see in this, uh, I mean, this almost looks like a, a, a line with just a little bit of inflection, but we've, there were decades when we were growing 15% per decade and uh, it's, it's going to be less than that the coming decades. Why is population slowing? When I presented to the council, I had like five slides on this, but I'm just gonna have this one slide here answer is it's everything. It's birth rates, it's death rates, it's reduced international immigration to the nation, uh, and it's also domestic migration. There was a lot of interest from our council members in that. Um, our finding at Met Council Research is that historically, over time, migration to the region has been very much aligned, um, coincident with uh, economic growth, employment growth. Our population, we attract people from other parts of the country when our economy is hot, when we're 
when we have a lot of jobs and a lot of job growth, that's the thing that, uh, that historically has led to pulling people in from the rest of the country. And we've, our advantage there, our, our, our past history, not quite the same anymore. I think we're now in a situation where, yeah, we have very low unemployment rates. There is still economic opportunity here, but that's no longer unique. All of our competing metro areas, other parts of the country, same conditions. So you don't have to leave Chicago to find work in Minneapolis. You can just stay in Chicago. And so I think that's, that's, a, that's a big part in the diminishment of migration to this, this region. There may be other reasons for people shying away from moving here as well. Aging of the population. Um, sooner or later, most of us, not, not us, but we, yeah. right, everyone else ages. <laughs> and um, we are gaining seniors uh, rapidly. And this is historically new because of the baby boom generation being such a large cohort of population. People born in the late 40s, the 1950s, and the early 60s were the largest generation up to that point, and the first generation to really experience longer life expectancies than what you saw before World War II. When, when Social Security uh, became a program in the 1930s, the average life expectancy was uh, in the low 60s. But if you were lucky, you might, you might reach 65. You might collect those Social Security benefits. Well, people live a lot longer now. People live 20 years longer. Um, and now we're seeing it in this time series where all of those <clears throat> babies boomed in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s are senior citizens. They're, they're, in, their, they're in their senior citizen years. And that number continues to grow uh, for two more decades. You see that the top, the top range of this chart, the light blue series, is the, the population over age 65. It, uh, it, will, it will more than double between now and 2050. Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Um, does this mirror the rest of the, yeah, I'm, I know the baby boomers are not unique to ours, but the percentage, it, of people and the percentage growth in the senior population, does it mirror it, the United States or is there some accounting for like the fact that a lot of our seniors are going south? Um, Madam Chair, I, I think the answer is that we're, we're fairly average. Uh, on this chart, you see 14% senior citizens in 2020. And I, I think the national rate was, was in the 15% range. It's not far off from that. There are parts of the country that are, uh, that look much older. Um, they tend to not be major metro areas. But I think, I think our metro, we're, we're typical, we're, we're average in this, uh, okay. in this regard. Uh, you asked about people moving to other, other parts of the country. Um, you know, I, I've, I've recently looked since, since uh, statistics were released, released uh, after the 2020 census. Uh, there was some analysis of long-term migration over the past four or five decennial censuses. Um, and the long-term trend for the Twin Cities is that we, we have an out-migration of people who are 55 to uh, 74. Um, people, there is a slight out-migration to, as you were saying, warmer parts of the country. But the, 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 funny, uh, the funny conclusion to that is that we have a, a big bounce back in the age 75 and over population every decade. People have eventually decided uh, Arizona is not for them. No, they get so old and sick that they can't take care of themselves. They well, or, that they too, or they come back here to be buried next yeah. to the family. Yeah, that's a, to be close to family. That's nice. It's cool. It's it's cool. It's it's one of the girls in the city. It's not dead people. Dan, did you have a question? Yeah, it was, uh, it was hard to understand from this graphic, probably <clears throat> because it's hard to understand from this graphic. But okay. So we've got you know, an increase of about 657,000 people coming into the metro area. Well, that's the net population. Right, the net growth. And I was trying to figure out sort of, are they all young people? Are they all over the map? 
Um, do they represent sort of the same distribution as our existing population, or are we seeing, uh, you know, the new people coming into the the growth in population? Is that primarily a younger cohort, or, or very similar to the overall current population? Yeah, I, I wish I brought the slide answering that question. Um, we we are we do throughout the time series have more people being born than dying, uh, so we're we're not uh, we're not one of those regions that's past that term. Um, in terms of migration, the, the international migration is uh, significant. The domestic migration is a, a churn of people both coming and leaving. Uh, and in that churn of people coming and leaving, we, um, I think there are maybe a couple of age groups where we historically have gained more than we've lost. Those would be uh, people who are, let's say, early career age and family age, 25 to 44, we're usually positive gaining that population. We also gain their kids, people who are age zero to 17. Um, we tend to lose people at college age. There may be more uh, college well, I guess going is, outside. Is the growth the basically based, based on sort of birth rate exceeding death rate or something like that, more than influx of new people from outside of the area? Well, this, or is again, it just slide is, is, like you said, all of these? Yeah, I mean, this slide is the, the net accumulation mm -hmm. of five different movements of, of people. Um, in, in general, I, I think the, the takeaway from this slide, since you were, you were asking about that, is, is that the demographic that's growing most notably and most rapidly is the, the senior population. And that, that is because of birth rates in the 1950s. So we're, we're still coasting on that. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Chair. Oh, sorry. Quick question. Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul have lost population the last two years. Are you predicting, I know you're not at city level, this is metro, right. uh, that an anomaly and it will not be continuing or do you have any thoughts? Yeah, at the end of this month we, we have an annual product it's called population estimates. We haven't released that yet. It should be ready the last week of, of May. I don't know if it'll show Minneapolis or St. Paul gaining or losing. It's uh, difficult to tell. I mean, certainly those cities and the region as a whole have gained housing. And when we distribute the annual population estimates to city managers and, and mayors, they look first at the number of housing units they've gained. And they expect that they'll be gaining population along with that. Uh, you, you referenced that the city might be losing people. The reason the city might be use, losing people is, is because of internal within household changes where um, uh, households have been trending smaller because of so much housing now being available that the 20-somethings who delayed forming their own households are now taking advantage in, of, of housing availability and starting to look for, for housing. That, that might be one reason why the average household size is trending down a little bit. And we'll see if Minneapolis and St. Paul gained or, or lost or, or stayed about the same. Next section of this presentation. Um, Mike, I wanted to talk about uh, I, I talk about how we come up with the region level forecast. And the next, the next big piece of work for me, Dennis, and uh, our, our our forecast team is taking those region level numbers, putting them into a second model that allocates where specifically in the region do we expect growth to be. And for that, we uh, a couple of years ago entered into a a service agreement with a company called UrbanSim.com. They provide us a modeling platform that we now use. We've built a, what's called a land use or real estate economics um, model of how the Twin Cities works. There are a couple of different, uh, you know, just to, to reduce it to three parts. Uh, the three parts sub-models within that are, first of all, a, a model that looks at Households and employers, and how they choose places to be in the region, how they site themselves or, or choose where to where to live. 
And it's, it's, uh, it's starting with observed data on how, what types of demographics choose what locations and what location factors, what neighborhood characteristics inform that. Uh, second thing on here is um, a real estate supply model in which we are calculating with household growth or employment change how much new housing stock or square, uh, or square footage floor space is needed and where will developers add that new real estate in order to capitalize on what parts of the region are hot markets in order to maximize their profits, all of the usual developer considerations. And finally, the, the middle bullet there, uh, we have a real estate price model and rents model that sort of equilibrates, uh, helps, helps clear the market, uh, helps clear the first two sub-models that I described. Well, this was a, a lot that I just described uh, to get to, um, this is how we go about allocating that growth of 650,000 people to specific places in the region. Uh, we have this model that, that ingests, takes in all of the data inputs that are listed uh, on this slide, its, uh, its starting conditions, its neighborhood characteristics, its, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the employment side, the non-residential side, it matters a lot where other businesses are because Retail businesses want to be very proximate to other retail businesses, and, and also there's some industrial district thing that goes on, um, agglomeration effects. Um, we're looking at land values and land prices. We're looking at densities and land consumption rates. And then finally, the, the last uh, two things that I'll mention, and maybe, maybe these are most important, uh, we look at what is allowed to be in any given place in the region uh, to conform with the comprehensive plans that we've received from the local governments. What I mean by that is we're taking a composite of all those comp comprehensive plans we've received from cities. We enter that into the model as, um, let's call it, uh, constraints or restrictions on what can be where. If the city of XYZ says that a certain neighborhood is only to be commercial or industrial, so that's what will be allowed there by the model. And if a, a different area is allowed to be mixed use, that opens up a lot of possibilities. Multiple things can compete for that, that site. Uh, so we're, we are taking that into consideration. Um, it's pretty much hard coded in. The model won't put any type of development in a place that a comprehensive plan wouldn't allow. Yeah, other policy type variables or influencers that go into the model, we know where uh, our urban services area for wastewater is defined to be. Uh, we also have a modeling of um, the transportation network in the year 2050, and we also have a mapping of where Met Council is planning for high frequency transit to be. And those end up being uh, factors that influence attraction of development and the type of development that would be in those areas. So it's, it's a lot. There's a, there's a lot of things being considered in this model. So now we come to the planning cycle. Um, our forecasts development really, really mirrors and, and runs alongside preparation of, of, uh, of the regional plans that are being uh, worked on now. Um, in 2020, we started the implementation of what I described as the urban sim model. We implemented it, we tested it, we calibrated it. It's just about now ready for production. And in you know this spring and summer, we're going to be producing a uh, what we're calling a, a preliminary forecast uh, that will be looked at by system planners internally. We're also this fall going to make it publicly available so that city planners and the public and, uh, and local and community leaders can take a look at this preliminary forecast and have some idea of 
you know, here we go, and have some idea of, of uh, how the forecast might be different from what we uh, what we shared in 2014 and 15. So, the preliminary forecast happens this year. Uh, I, I mentioned sharing it with our system planners here in the building. We're inviting them to take this uh, this spatial distribution of where we expect population and households and employment and types of housing to be and enter it into other models that are used here in the building for infrastructure planning that includes waste, the wastewater system, um, water supply modeling, travel demand modeling. Uh, use the preliminary forecast to put those subsequent downstream models through their paces and we're asking that by next winter, our system planners return to my team their feedback and also their results um, <clears throat> that they get out of the, the subsequent modeling. Uh, just one example, uh, Dennis Farmer and uh, Jonathan Ehrlich will be working on a new modeling of the transportation network and congestion conditions now through 2050. Uh, we will ask them to return to us their results from that modeling uh, so that we will have a fresher set of uh, what parts of the region uh, have what kind of accessibility terrain. Um, and what I mean by that is how long it takes to get from any point A to any point B. Uh, because congestion, uh, transportation network conditions, that could be a thing that, that affects development. Uh, Jumping ahead, I showed you this slide earlier saying that one of the things that we use in our modeling that we bring in as a, as a constraint for providing an envelope of what's possible in any given place is the set of policies that Met Council has, including Met Council's established uh, Metro Urban Services Area, where we expect the year 2050 high frequency transit waves to be what we expect for um, what we expect for the transportation network highway network in the year 2050 and you know it could be more in addition to that we could uh, if, if we're given uh, if we're given information on what new policies we should be modeling we can strategize on how those would be represented in the model and incorporated into the model. And so I say all this as, as a, I'm not sure how much time you want to allot to this, but an invitation to this advisory committee to tell us what policies uh, maybe are, are new to the Met Council and need to be, uh, need to be considered. <clears throat> Madam Chair? Go ahead. Uh, first of all, Tracking the Met Council numbers for the last two decades, I applaud you on the accuracy. Um, being at the city level, quite often individual cities always want higher numbers. Or lower. Uh, well, I've seen it, but overall, your number has been very accurate, less than 1%. When mm -hmm. you get to the end of the decade and look back, and then it's sub-split. Now, unless you're like Lakeville, where you have crazy growth, and you know right. where it moves within uh, specific regions. The uh, one thing though, I uh, said on a transportation uh, call today, AI and uh, autonomous cars and electric cars, I think that'll have more influence, especially when we look out 25 years, in my view. In some way, I think having a statement in the forecast that it's considered and how it was considered okay. would be beneficial. Um, especially when you look at CO2 emissions, et cetera. I know the state numbers, one out of five cars by 2030. I don't know what the 2040 and 2050 is, but that whole element will go away by the time we have this forecast, if we're all gonna be on electric, like I think federally, there's a major push. And then jobs, uh, if AI, you know, over half the jobs could go away, you know, that's not too far away, 25 years. 
what does that mean to our transportation networks and all these other elements? Yeah. We, we spent a lot of time 10 years ago talking about uh, vehicle sharing and autonomous mm -hmm. vehicles and stuff, and we still haven't really gotten <laughs> very far from where we were 10 years ago. No, but you see the electric has changed quickly, and the networks aren't in. Yeah, you know, the distribution network that, is, right. is the limiting yeah. factor on that. As yeah. soon as you get the networks in and uh, monies that are allocated federally within five years, ten, if we don't have them all in, uh, we're not spending much money correctly. Anybody else? Can, can I ask, or Matt? Yeah, here? go ahead. Um, so there are a couple things that I don't know how much, how interactive your modeling is with policy from the Met Council because what what the Met Council does sometimes drives uh, uh, certain development in certain spots so there's like a there's a give and take and I don't know if you account for that or if you're just measuring taking out any action of what the Met Council does because it seems like in my opinion the Met Council serves, but also has an agenda. So they push their thoughts on, on the whole Met area, and in, in, in many respects, and in some respects, they take in, okay, what does the, what does the metro area need, and then has a, has a needs approach to uh, the services that they offer. And I don't know how much back and forth there is in this. But then the other thing is, um, it's around transportation, and um, some of the transportation decisions you as an economist and econometric, uh, an econometric look at, like I would love it if one of those pushes and pulls that the Met Council does is they love their light rail no matter what, and they it doesn't seem like there's any economics behind it like you could have like the if we look at the north star there are 2500 people that ride that and there's they spent like as a, as an aggregate it was it's a 300 million dollar plus system and so um it would be nice if you had some this is some gift some dollars involved with some of the transportation analysis done is it is the transportation system efficient would it change the forecast if we sort of let transportation happen as a result of what people want rather than whatever the Met Council feels like or thinks is the best approach, whether the marketplace likes it or not. Um, and so, um, I would be curious. You know, I'd be curious about the give and take on the transportation, and then also on just the policies in general for the model. Madam Chair, can I respond? Please, Jonathan. I, I think um, I think yeah. Our, our objective is to represent how people how people choose locations and, as you put it, what what they want. So, for example, uh, one of the major systems that we have is wastewater service to a million households and a growing number, more than a million in the future. And um, so we have this service area, and we. Uh, we included uh, presence, uh, we included service area as a location characteristic. Did any given neighborhood have use of service in 2020 or is it planned for 2040? And, and we found that that was a significant predictor variable in location choices and in how people value real estate. It turns out what people want is they do want uh, flushable toilets. They do want that. <laughs> and they, they value it. It actually you know, very much increases 
I live outside Musa, and our toilets actually flush. <laughs> I know what you're saying. Yes, yes. yes. So that's a, for for sewer service rather than a drain field in that property. Totally get it. Yeah, I agree with that. I just wish that there was a. I wish there was economics on top of some of the overarching things that the Met Council pushes. So, I'm glad John, are you saying like instead of in, you could have one scenario of blue line extension gets built and another scenario where that two billion dollars is spent on some other transportation investment? Yeah, I feel like sometimes when we do mo when people quants come in and do modeling and say here's what should happen an efficient uh, an efficient means of transporting people throughout the metro is freeways and buses. Um, oftentimes, government likes to say, well, that's too bad. We're going to build light rails that not many people ride anyways. And so um, it would be nice if, you, if your input was taken to develop policy rather than policy being developed with no economics in mind. And you just have to react to the policy rather than you helping make the policy. I agree with you more than you know. And, and we've <laughs> Jerry? See, I'm a little confused here. Bill confused me here a little bit. Uh, he said your models have been very accurate. Did you predict everything that I've read this winter and things that I've heard? Like, for instance, downtown Minneapolis is empty. Did, I mean, did you predict that? Um, I probably, you probably didn't. But this COVID thing has completely disrupted, I think, all your models, really. I mean, I remember here in this room a year ago, two years ago, or whatever, people were talking about how, how should we do the bus, uh, bus traffic? How should we do bus routes and things. And a lot of people thought, oh, as soon as COVID is done there, it's all gonna come back. And I said it wasn't, and yes, it didn't come back. So I think, like to transportation, if they build all these light rail to go into the cities that nobody rides it anyway. I mean, it seems like, are, are your model, did you predict, is this in your models or, or what? I'm, I'm kind of confused because it seems like transportation is a big thing, but it seems like Light rail is not the correct way, I think, to address transportation needs, and that influences people that are going to come into the metro area or downtown or something. Well, uh, Chair Wolf and, and Member Gruner, I, I, I'd say uh, I, I haven't wanted, I haven't wanted to, to make heroic claims about accuracy or our models. I, I appreciate Bill saying that our models. <laughs> well, and let me much. just clarify. Uh, Every 10 years, census data, and I'm saying on those decades, your models are very accurate. Not predicting COVID and all the individual years. Things time. tend to work out over time. Well, I didn't mean to predict COVID, yes. but the effects of it. Yeah. Things like that are going to come along. If, if and when they come along, they affect you know, everything, like trans transportation policy and everything. Yes. So I can't see how, understand how your models can take that into consideration to make them accurate in the future or so. Well, the short answer is is they, they can't. These, these models, they cannot. These models are uh, steady state models that assume equilibrium of, of a whole lot of dynamics. And that's where, that's where we get it wrong. We, we're not able to predict the pandemic because it's not an epidemiological model. And, and that, that was sort of a... a one of one of our uh, council member Cunningham, when he was here, he used to call them black swan events. <laughs> things that you just they just come out of uh, nowhere. You can't you cannot predict them. So what we uh, in in this new cycle of modeling, we are making some adjustments. We're at the beginning of that process. We don't have the local level forecasts to share with you yet. We do have the region level forecasts that I presented in uh, in this in this session. Um, we expect growth to be reduced. We are also making some changes in assumptions about commuting. 
where people we're, we're going to be making some assumptions that commuting is lessened because we've we've now made this uh, we've now crossed this break point where there's a lot more remote work people and employers some employers like the remote work remote work seems to be a thing that's going to be here to stay and to your point that may end up looking like uh, some emptying out of this downtown um, it, it does feel like that working here that, uh, that things have emptied out it's not the same downtown as you saw in previous decades sure so there's there's two parts to emptying out of downtown though sometimes it's maybe a lot less office workers during the day but it seems like there's been a continuing process of developing housing in both downtowns and so now you've got more people living in the downtown maybe in terms of population but not as many people perhaps there during the day as, as workers and so there's different dynamics at play that are resulting sort of from the same thing which was the pandemic and all the factors associated with that that have to be accounted for but it seems to me that that a model is only as good as the information you put into it and and you can't and you, you're and you know it, it only knows what it knows um, it's not AI yet that doesn't doesn't have that capability as far as I know but um, but so in terms of policies I think that you can do two things you can you can model for the next 20 30 whatever 40 years based on known policies at this point and for instance transportation known transportation or known planned transportation but you can't certainly model for things you don't know um, but I suppose you could then take something like that and if you wanted to make a decision to say we're going to, as a Met Council, we're going to fund, you know, 10% more BRT routes throughout the metro area, and they're going to be approximately here and here and here. You could probably figure something like that into your model and help to understand the impacts of that sort of decision making. Is that a fair way to assess what, what your work is and how it relates to what we've been kind of talking about here? Uh, yes, sir. That is the plan. That's what we're doing with the, the land use model, and also it's, uh, it's twin the travel demand model. Cool. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was just curious, Todd, do you ever consider in your models, have you ever considered incomes? I know that we talked about you know, being able to purchase um, residential areas in certain certain areas, we have, we have expansion, or do, uh, if we have job growth. Do you ever talk about, or do you look at any types of income or even like cost of living? Is there any of that kind of a model available? Uh, yes, Member Klein and Chair Wolf, that, that is uh, that is one of the things that we're taking into consideration when we segment the market of households into different household types. And we're doing modeling of how low income, middle income, and, and high income strata would be choosing neighborhoods to live in and, uh, and, and types of housing that is explicitly considered in, in the model. And uh, as, you, as you'd expect, we do end up in the model scape with something that approximates what we have seen always in the real world is that there, there is some uh, separation or, or segregation of, uh, of, of income levels in this region. So I have a question related to that. We're going to hear in the next presentation about the percentage of people that are low income that would be projected to come here. Is that part of what you look at also? How, what's the size of those blocks? Or uh, Madam Chair, yes, we, uh, we we do parse the the household market into four income levels. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is the next bunch of people going to be similarly situated from previous decades, or are we seeing more low-income people coming in the next 30 years? Well, if you can imagine it as a distribution, it's a distribution that we, we hold, let's say, fairly constant over, over, the, over the whole forecast period. Um, and the way that we're defining those income groups is relative to the average median family income of the region. And the median is always at the 50th percentile. So um, in, in, that, in that sense, uh, I don't really have an answer for you. Are we well, all going to get wealthier or, or not? 
Um, no, I'm just, because I, I looked ahead for the side presentation for later, and it said that 65% of the growth was going to be below 50% AMI. So that's way skewed. Yes. And I don't know if that's normal, that new people come in way skewed and everybody else is doing better, or if that's a departure from the past. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, if I, 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 should, I should correct my previous statement. If, uh, if you were just looking at working age population, the population under 65, the income distribution in the future is going to look very similar to now. Uh, but if you then add in the over 65 population, that's where the income distortions are, are, are happening. Um, retirees do not have the income that, uh, in general, they don't have the, the income that, uh, that working age or family age populations have. And that, that's, that's the reason why it, it appears like there's this rapid growth in the low income population. It's mostly that aging of the population. I hope that makes sense. Okay. I'll ask I try. about that later when we get to the other presentation. Thank you. Anybody else? I just have a question about the discussion questions so that I understand when we're answering these questions like what limits or policy should be explored and all these other ones like where is our feedback going like do it does it go to the Met Council to inform what they're doing or can you just speak to that because I'm just having a little trouble like I feel like I've just been listening to folks and there's a lot of different just general land use philosophies going around and like I just it would help me to understand what happens with what we're telling you right now and where is it going and what is it in for? Uh, Chair Wolf and, and members, the, the feedback goes to the council member who's, who's assigned to this, this committee, <laughs> uh, the staff that we, we have here taking notes, and, and also to the, the forecast team, since I'm, I'm here specifically wanting to know how our forecast model should be adjusted to reflect um, what advisors are, are, are thinking should be in, in the model. Um, if you know, if when we when we get su suggestions, uh, I and Dennis and, and uh, our other colleagues who aren't here are discussing: is it is it practical, um, tractable to represent that in in the model space? And if we can, we we uh, we may. Yes. And so when you say like limits, when the question says what limits or policies should be explored with respect to future development, is that like Met Council policy or the policy for how you do? I'm just having trouble understanding the question. Like, yes. What uh, are you asking us? Member Chilhali Nelson and, and, and Chair Wolf, um, it can be Met Council policies or it could be policies or limits coming from other levels of the government. In okay. fact, the last time I presented on this with, uh, with Council Member Wolf. We were talking about uh, water supply mm -hmm. policy and the current um, uncertainty in the communities surrounding White Bear Lake and uh, DNR's expectation of growth limits in that area, and also much less clear, much more unclear direction from uh, the district court in its. Uh, in its handling of the water usage case. Okay. So we do want to represent those policies if we can clarify what the policy is coming out of that district court. When it could be things like the rent control stuff in St. Paul and what impact is that having on the, the market for new yes. apartment buildings and, and whether you see a change in that coming or no. So that would be your local expertise that you could share yeah. with us. I mean, I would just say in general, like we, in, the, in St. Paul, our, poli our housing policy has been, we need to relax needless zoning restrictions. We need to embrace denser housing. We need a huge expansion of transit. We can't just keep asking Minneapolis and St. Paul to like, build all the housing and the suburbs and the greater suburbs don't. We need all of the following cities to follow suit. We need them to like end exclusionary zoning. We need them to pass local tenant protections. We need the state to do things like fund gap financing for housing. The private market alone is not solving the problem. Um, you know, there's a billion dollar housing bill that just came through. So we're gonna see where that goes. But if we have that, we have the Metro sales tax that's bringing in like an extra, I thought it was an extra 200 million and I don't know what the exact amount is, but it's just a, a tremendous amount of additional funding is becoming available for subsidizing a whole array of new development. 
And I think taking a regional look at housing with the with the expectation that everyone needs to carry their weight, like financially, policy wise, zoning, everything within your control that you can, it just it needs to happen. And I think that in Minneapolis and St. Paul, at least someone whose perspective is the two cities are working usually in tandem, we are we are adopting very similar land use policies like we've eliminated parking minimums. Um, Minneapolis, I think, intends to, but I don't know if they've fully done it yet, but that frees up having to like build in dedicated space for exclusively cars in you know the type of neighborhood patterns and transportation we're trying to create. Um, you know, we're doing, we have a huge like streets reconstruction plan in St. Paul where we're kind of getting funding for and are funding some of it. So I just, I'm, like, I think we just need more of everything. We need more transportation. We need more place for people to live. Like we need that to be, we, I, I personally think Minneapolis, St. Paul and the whole surrounding area need to start to feel more like a continuous um, community. And it doesn't mean that it will all feel like one mega city, but right now you can tell the difference pretty starkly if you leave St. Paul and you go into like a different neighboring community that the feel of the community changes, the cost of living, et cetera. And there just needs to be like a more regional approach to how we're doing this because I think that it is creating inequities both within and beyond the cities. And unless there is a bigger direction besides municipalities fighting it out amongst themselves, I think those inequities are only going to worsen. And the last thing I'll say is as someone who's watching these things all around the country, like different states are trying different things and I'm still working to evaluate, is it working well, is it not? But like in California, they literally have a builder's remedy law that says if you as a local community do not eat your vegetables and like eliminate old laws that are hindering housing and meet certain targets, the state steps in and they literally make you build the housing. Like there's there's aggressive state level planning happening to, to basically push local governments to make sure that they're doing their part. So, you know, I think we need to get to a place in Minnesota, maybe not quite that aggressive, but where there's an overt regional approach and it's not just like, well, here in, I'm not even naming Roseville for any reason, I've just got Roseville in my mind, but like here in Roseville, we're doing this and in Columbia Heights is this and then in Minneapolis, it's this. And like, I just, we need like a more coordinated regional plan. That is my, you know, and I'm not actually in a space very often to say that because I go and work at the city of St. Paul all day and it's just St. Paul, St. Paul, St. Paul. But I, when I'm like at the tab or the other spaces I'm in listening to the conversation, like, I think we need to get to that place. So this is very high level, but just now that I understand like what the question is, where it's going, that would be my feedback. Thank you. And we are about out of time. Okay. We've run over actually on our time. And so you can feel free to email your thoughts if you if you have them about this. So don't don't feel like you can't say anymore because we ran out of time. <laughs> The, the ability to email Todd is unlimited. <laughs> Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. Appreciate the clarification of the questions. Too. Okay. Sorry about that, Todd. So, thank you very much for that. Next up is uh, scenario modeling results, transportation and housing finding. Dennis and Hillary. Maybe they didn't put you on the online list here. I didn't know that, but, but we're glad to be right here. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Barishka Mishtaz, and I am a planning analyst at the uh, CD Research. So I'm here um, to give you a brief overview of scenario planning. Some of you were here um, last time I was here was four months ago. So I just figured we can just do a little refresher and then my colleagues are gonna be stepping in and talking about the transportation and housing results of our study. Um, so last time I was here, I think it was November 17th. I'm sorry, that's the first time I was here. I talked a little bit about basics of scenario planning. And uh, on January 19th, I came back to talk uh, in more detail about um, scenario planning and talked uh, also about the land, land use impacts of the exercise. And uh, so once I finish, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis Farmer and my colleague Hillary back there. Um, and she's going to be talking about the housing piece. Where am I coming? 
Hey, Todd, what, which way should she be Where are you that thing? Oh, I don't know. I do do it for Greg's doing his magic for you. All right, as I mentioned, I'll start with the recap. We'll talk about <coughs> layers and transportation and the housing findings. So um, just as a reminder, um, I just want to explain the framework and the, what I mean by um, scenarios. Um, as you know, the council is in the um, business of uh, managing regional growth. And when we look at it from this point of view, the biggest uncertainty that we're facing is how regional growth is going to shake out. So to be able to understand how we can um, manage it or plan for it, we need to understand where people will be living. And the two pieces of uncertainty that we face are where, how, much, how many more residents will come into the region and where they would live. So um, this is important because we make our invest, investment and service decisions based on how many people will be around and where they would be living. So to be able to um, understand and uh, plan for um, the future uncertainty about what the future might look like, we decided to come up with a model, a, a practice called scenario planning, to look at potential futures where um, our population might be distributed differently. And one of the reasons for that, as Todd was mentioning, was it's hard to um, know exactly how many people will be in the region. There are uh, uncertainties associated with it because it's external to us. There is migration. There is some inertia with birth rates and uh, death rates, obviously. But migration would be the, uh, the biggest piece, and also the economy would be the other one. Um, and in terms of where people live, it really depends on people's means and where they would like to live. And that's outside the um, council's control as well. So um, to be able to analyze this, we just decided to look at these uncertainties and construct some scenarios. The first one we um, decided to look at is what we consider a business as usual scenario. The business as usual scenario is business as usual. Can we do a little less review so that we have time to talk? Or I sure think we're thing. gonna run out of time if we go at this pace. Okay, I will make sure to speed it up. So um, with the business as usual, everything will be what we anticipate right now going into the future would stay with us. Um, with other options, we have first higher than uh, expected growth and lower than expected growth. And then we have more compact locational choices versus more dispersed locational choices. The high and grow are fairly obvious in terms of what we're going to get in terms of growth. But uh, when it comes to locational choices, when I say compact, what I mean by that is uh, most of the regional growth would be in, in the region's core where um, the environment is already built and there's higher density development. When we look at the dispersed locations, uh, we're talking mostly about areas outside the, uh, the two cities and the er inner ring suburbs. Uh, these are basically um, suburbs that are lower density and they're lesser developed. So um, I showed you these maps before. These are uh, what the scenarios look like on the ground. These are population maps, and it shows uh, the maps show you where uh, most of our population growth will take place. The um, lighter green ones are places where the population is not going to grow as much. The darker green places are where population is going to grow. And um, if you look at the top left map, that is showing the business as usual. This is how we're going to grow as we uh, continue if nothing changes. And as you can see, it's fairly balanced, both in the core cities and the suburban areas. If you look at the top middle map, then that is the high growth, more compact scenario. And if you look at the core of that map, it's the darker areas there, so we're growing in the core. The map right next to it shows the dispersed option, and it's the donut growth pattern um, that you can see on the map. The region's core is on the lighter side, color-wise. And uh, most of the growth is happening in the suburban um, areas. And uh, the bottom two maps are just lighter versions of the top two. Um, they're just less experiencing less growth. 
Um, and um, this is a map of the employment patterns going forward in the five scenarios. And the main point I want you to take away from this is that um, employment patterns are unique to the region, wherever highways are, wherever um, freight uh, routes are, and wherever locations that are highly um, accessible to a transit network is where the jobs grow usually. And you see a clustering of jobs around those areas. Um, and the main point in here, if you look at the top middle and the top right maps, is that even when uh, we are growing in dispersed or compact fashion population-wise, employment structures tend to remain the same. The map maps are almost identical. So um, there is a stability to employment um, geography and uh, regardless of how population is growing. So this was sort of a very brief um, overview of the um, scenario uh, framework. Then we moved a little into the land use aspects of the scenario framework, and I specifically um, talked about um, some of the land use measures that we use to understand the impacts of these scenarios on our systems. So um, because each future has a different distribution of jobs and people, land use differs accordingly. People use land and employment and jobs uh, or businesses use land accordingly. So we picked three land use measures to understand the impact of these scenarios on our systems. And these were the three that we picked. Land consumed, which was measured by total acres of land developed. Density of land use is another one, and we measured that with average acres of land use per household. And agricultural land developed was the other metric. So I showed um, land use modeling results. I'm not going to go through the details of them. I'll just summarize the findings. But these charts basically show you how um, land is developed, how much land is developed under each scenario, and how dense development is under each scenario. And uh, we also have one chart on the agricultural land um, the amount of agricultural land consumed by development. And in this case as well, um, it just, the bar charts show in each case how much uh, agricultural land is consumed as a result of development. So the findings from these um, um, metrics or results are primarily, they show us that compact development in these scenarios um, uses land more intensely and efficiently. So in terms of the amount of land consumed, compact development scenarios develop the fewer um, acres in the region. When it comes to dispersed development, it actually is the type of development uh, which increases pressure on agricultural land and it maximizes or increases the amount of land consumed by um, development. So um, why do we look at these measures very quickly? We look at these measures because they give us an idea of how our um, regional values and vision um, um, is expressed. And uh, so just to give you an example, for instance, when we look at, um, in this table, when you look at the check mark between uh, land developed and natural system protected and restored, it basically tells us that the more land is developed, um, the harder it is for us to protect our natural system. So in that sense, we can look at this statement and we can look at the amount of land developed coming out of each scenario and we can make uh, an assertion about how does each scenario impact our um, values as we assert them. And you see four vision components that the council endorsed. So in this case, uh, a scenario, for instance, a compact scenario uh, which uses less land in development might be better suited to um, protect our natural systems. That's the um, upshot of it. And uh, the next table is exactly the same except for transportation measures. And uh, my colleague Dennis is going to discuss them now. But I want you to keep that kind of matrix in your mind between measures that we're looking at and what they mean from our vision and values um, as they're endorsed by the council. And I'll turn it over to Dennis. Oh. Um, either way is working. Okay. Um, um, thank you, Madam 
Madam Chair, uh, members. Um, my name is Dennis Farmer, and I work in the modeling and research section of uh, transportation planning here at the Met Council, um, otherwise known as UTS. Um, and um, I guess one thing I wanted to preface by saying is that one thing I think the discussion we've had brings up a good point is that uh, when we model and we talk about forecasts, we often don't do a very good job as modelers or planners in communicating the fact that any, any forecast is based, there, it's sort of a, if this happens, then this happens, right? So there's a series of assumptions behind a forecast. And when we show a forecast, we're saying, and we don't always maybe describe what goes into that forecast and what those uh, assumptions are, but you know, any forecast is basically, has a bunch of assumptions behind it. And we're saying, if this happens, then we think this is the most likely outcome. So I think it was um, Member Bruner who said, um, talked about COVID and, our forecast, our long-range forecasts, um, yeah, they don't assume things like um, epidemics, so they don't assume things like uh, war or famine or things like that. So um, that is something we need to think about. It, it is, a, it is a if this then then that. So, and I think this scenario planning is one way of trying to capture that by mixing up some of those um, assumptions to seeing what to show how these things might be different. So. I'm going to talk about some initial forecasting we've done for transportation-related outcomes for each of the scenarios that Barish just talked about. Um, to get these results, we've taken these different growth scenarios and we've put them into the same transportation model that we use for our transportation policy plan, for our 2040 transportation policy plan. Um, and we're also using, our assumption there is that we're using the 2040 uh, transportation policy plan network um, otherwise known as the current revenue scenario or the fiscally constrained network for 2040. So what we plan to invest in uh, by 2040 according to the current transportation plan. Um, so there's a number of, of measures we can pull out of this scenario planning and we'd really be interested in hearing your inputs on some of the things that we should be looking at. But right now, um, I'm gonna look at some of the measures that some of the things that we typically do when we look at the transportation policy plan. Um, so. And one of these scenarios that, um, or one of these measures that Frisch just talked about is greenhouse gas emissions. Um, using information from the regional travel demand model um, with each of these scenarios, which looks at things like, uh, it forecasts things like how much people are gonna travel, how far they're gonna travel, how fast they travel. That's based a lot on congestion that we forecast, uh, as well as what mode of travel they use. And with that, we use a couple models to forecast the average weekday greenhouse gas emissions. Um, again, this is an average. This is an average weekday. So, um, and what what we've shown in this chart is using sort of that business as usual that Bruce talked about, which is sort of what the region would look like if growth over the last over the next few decades sort of mirrored what we've seen lately. Um, we've taken that and then we've looked at how these different scenarios, how the greenhouse gas emissions, the average weekday greenhouse gas emissions vary by these different um, scenarios. So what we see, one of the big things that sort of pops out is um, that greenhouse gases emissions, they're driven by both the development pattern, whether it's compact or dispersed, but also growth. So in both of the high growth uh, scenarios, both compact and dispersed, we see greenhouse gas emissions, average weekday, go up based on the baseline. And that makes sense because we know that more people tend, and more employment tends to lead to more travel, which is going to lead to more emissions. Again, now that, again, the assumption there is that using similar technologies and similar commuting patterns, so that's um, one assumption that might change and that we might want to look at a little bit deeper. But, you know, using some of the existing patterns as existing technologies, high growth in the future is going to increase greenhouse gases about 4 to 8% over what sort of that business as usual would be. Um, and lower growth would mean we were going to have fewer emissions, at least in this region. Um, but another thing is that within those, for a given growth pattern, we do see that greenhouse gas emissions uh, do go down between a more compact development and a more dispersed development. You kind of see the effect. Uh, excuse me. You kind of see the effect of um, land use if you if you subtract the the two top bars from each other or the two bottom bars, and it's um, compact dispersed. Going from a compact to dispersed is about three, about four to three percent uh, difference just going between those two. It's a little higher if we have more growth because there's more growth in the compact. But, um, so one reason for that is because um, with a more compact scenarios and more compact development, we do forecast that there would be slightly less travel 
Um, so this looks at the forecasted average weekday miles per capita. So what that basically means is, on average, how much is how many miles is each person traveling uh, on a weekday? Um, and right now, in the business as usual, it's about 23. Uh, that number varies between about 23 and 25. Um, it's obviously a little bit lower now, coming out of, of COVID. Um, but what we see is that um, in both, because this is normalized by the population, we do see that in both compact scenarios, uh, we do see people traveling anywhere between uh, a seven, seven tenths of a mile less to, um, although going up to six tenths of a mile more per day. Those seem pretty small, but one thing to realize is this is per person. So depending upon the scenario, that's four to, that's three to four million people, I think, in the future. So small changes in how much people travel on average across the region has some pretty big effects. So. And we did look at kind of, in the model, we looked at why this is happening, and we noticed it's, it's a combination of small things. It's not just one thing. It's a combination of we're forecasting. Uh, people are driving uh, a little bit less. Uh, there are some switches from people from motorized modes to non-motorized modes or from cars to buses, a little more carpooling. Uh, I think some fewer trips. Uh, but it's not just one thing. It's a combination of things that are leading to this. So, all right, where are we now? OK. Another thing we look at, uh, and I'm almost done here, um, is that we also look at, on, under the different land use and transportation scenarios, we also look at what we call accessibility, which is not just congestion, but it's how much can you get to, right, in a certain period of time. So that looks at both congestion, because how much you can get to is a function of uh, how fast you can go, but it also looks at surrounding land use, and what is there around you that you can get to. Um, we also look at it for transit as well. And so one of the things we looked at is we looked at how many places, people, how many jobs people can get to in each of these scenarios by either car in one half hour or by transit in one half hour. And this chart, again, goes back to comparing all these uh, scenarios to the business as usual. And we also see kind of that same pattern, too, is that uh, accessibility is affected by growth, right? High growth means if there's more stuff in the region, there's more stuff you can get to. But we also do, again, notice that trend where in a compact uh, scenario for a given growth, whether it's high or low, um, compact does lead to uh, greater um, accessibility. Um, and it's even, it's especially pronounced when you get to transit. And that makes sense because the ability to get someplace by transit in 30 minutes is really a, you, you really have to have access to the high frequency transit network at that point. As we know, that's largely focused in the core. So uh, transit is, is, is really, transit accessibility is really affected by whether we live in a dispersed or a compact developed region um, in the future. Uh, but compact is about, has about four times as much uh, of a change in accessibility uh, compared to low growth. Um, and the reason for that, and this is my last slide, is um, because of that, because of that concentration of travel market air, transit market areas that have high frequency being uh, within the uh, being within the core uh, of the region. So this chart shows how uh, the population that live within a more transit rich, more uh, transit frequent areas like transit market area one and two, how the populations in those areas grow uh, or change based on whether you're in the compact and dispersed. And as you can see that. Transit market populations in transit markets one and two are much higher in those compact growth scenarios or compact development scenarios, whereas in the dispersed, we see more people living in those transit markets four and five that don't have uh, as much uh, transit. So, but none of them get to where more than half of the people in the region have good access to transit. Right. Yep. So that's one thing, too, is that, yeah, you do see that, you know, um, because of the extent of the transit network, you do see that there that does sort of limit the change that you see even going between a compact and a dispersed scenario. So the only way to move that would be to make a change to the network, basically. A, 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 a more robust network would get more people within the ability to use it, basically. Yeah. That would be a policy decision. Yeah, Madam Chair, members, I think, yeah, one an expansion of the, of the transit network would be one way to move that up, or also, um, a much more compact uh, scenario than, but yeah, you're better exactly using right. the existing yeah. network. But yeah, it does show the limitations of even the like a compact scenario and what it what it can do. But Phil, did you have a question? Yeah, just on your side, I thought it was 
is would be just the retail development itself being closer, being more compact, as a versus now we have to drive to Target or the grocery store versus being able to walk or to ride a bicycle. I like, sort of like I look at this more like being in Europe. You go to Europe, you can walk to any place or ride a bicycle, and you're there within a minute, a few minutes, versus here if we have to drive. So I think where we put our retail locations and our commercial development has a lot to do with how we do our transportation. That's all, Scott. So our next slide is about who has access to transit market areas. Oh, my name is Hillary Lovelace. <laughs> not Jonathan Donovan. Um, it's not a bad name. It's okay, but it's not mine. Um, <laughs> I'm a housing planning analyst here at the Metropolitan Council. Uh, because we're doing uh, transportation and housing together, I thought it would be fun to do kind of a bridging slide before I spend the rest of the time talking about <clears throat> low-income households in our region, to talk about how low-income households are served by transit market areas one and two between different scenarios. In the compact scenarios, more low-income households have the option of living without a car or the ability to use transit to get around um, than in dispersed scenarios. Um, as somebody who frequently has lived without a car and uh, at times by choice and at times not by choice, I just think this is really important to share in our framing. <clears throat> so as we're talking about housing, we're gonna kind of go through three different sections in this presentation. The first, we'll talk a little bit about housing in each of the different scenarios at large. Then we'll focus on two of our largest policy tools here at the council, one being the allocation of affordable housing need across our region, um, and the second being what does land guided for affordable housing look like in each of these scenarios. I think I could make the case that both of our um, large housing policy levers help meet all of our vision components, but the ones that they most clearly meet um, are equitable, inclusive, and welcoming, and climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. The descriptions of these scenarios, this is kind of a dumb slide, I apologize, I've never tried to put this much text on a slide, um, but I thought it was important to give a good idea of what each of these looks like and what the differences are between them. Within the high compact scenario, um, there's a lot of differences that can happen to our built environment, including attached ownership opportunities, possibly growing, and communities that have pretty uniform single family housing stock seeing a lot of change. Um, in the high dispersed scenarios, it's likely that lot sizes may grow, making it more expensive for folks to enter detached housing ownership opportunities uh, as they get more expensive. And there could be an increased focus that we're currently seeing a rise in today on the uh, municipal control of detached rental, um, especially as we might see more uh, rental in detached housing across the region. And um, can I just comment for one second? Yeah. Um, I can't see a future where lot sizes grow regardless of the development patterns because land is expensive Precisely. and people less and less are want not people don't want to maintain a big yard unless they have a Jonathan yard where you mow it with a tractor. You know, <laughs> my, my, uh, my, my son lives in Henderson Township, so he can have an acreage, but people who are moving here are when looking for single family homes have been getting smaller and smaller lots for the last 30 years because the price of land keeps going up in places where there is city water available. So just a comment on the... Thank you for your comment, Chair. <laughs> the, these are meant to be, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, because I'm not the scenario planning expert, in the but uh, these are meant to be kind of extremes, um, just to make the point that uh, each reality can show differences between that. Madam Chair, did you say that part of the reason why land was so expensive was because they refused to build roads to places where land is less expensive? Did I hear that? I did not say that. Um, 
the, the, I the, thought I heard it in there. The, the, <laughs> I'm pretty the, sure I heard it in there. The, the, the collar counties have relevant <clears throat> made the, the uh, case recently that spending in Dakota, Scott, Carver, Anoka, and Washington is far less than what happens in, in Hennepin and, and Ramsey. And so most of the road expansion that's been going on to serve new growth has been coming at the expense of the counties and the cities. And Hennepin also tends to have a bias towards the, the inner part of the county rather than the outer parts. But um, that tends to, the, the cost for that tend to fall on the locals rather than on the state or the federal. I'll continue with this yeah. slide. Um, Madam Chair, just one quick comment. One of the reasons why they're shrieking is I've been told that my council is, is, is doing the requirement to make more housing in the same area. So that some of the, and that's not true? It's more of la it's land price related. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense, you know, in Eden or someplace yeah. farther in. They're getting more and more multifamily because the land is so expensive that it can't support single family unless you're super duper rich. And farther out, we have not changed the, the guidance for the, the developing edge. It's still three to five acres. Really? Okay. Three, I was told that three to five builder. units per acre. I was told that by a builder that the Met Council has required them to put nope. more housing units per acres. No. Nope. Acres. Really? Really? I think, Jerry, what the Met Council hasn't required, but what I was joking about was the lack of its intentional compacting the region by <clears throat> transportation patterns and disallowing and not spending money on roads that go out to where land is less expensive. Like they want, it seems like they want a scenario where not only is uh, transportation tight and housing is tight, but also housing is less expensive. And so uh, there hasn't been a requirement, but the policy has that policies that have been enacted have constricted development. The, the, the number one factor for where development happens is, is it eligible for city water and sewer? Yeah. The, the patterns of the transportation system are from long-standing state policies on transportation funding. And yeah, choices what, by the legislature and MnDOT. Not, that's what I'm saying. Not Met Council. Right. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> so Met Council's got a huge budget for light rail. We all know that. And so does Hennepin County. And Actually, it's Hennepin County's money that we're spending. Fair enough. Hennepin <laughs> County doesn't spend any money either in connecting the inexpensive land to the yes. system. Okay, go ahead, Hillary. Let's we'll get through this. Thank you, Gerald. Um, in low and compact uh, scenario, we anticipate that this might be the one scenario in which you might have a housing deficit worsen, where we might have. Um, population grow faster than the development of housing, um, even with a low um, building, um, even, even with low population growth, rather, uh, and see a lot of reinvestment in kind of our legacy cities uh, towards the center of the region. In the low dispersed um, scenario, a big focus on maintenance of aging infrastructure uh, and a lot of pressure um, on uh, lot sizes um, to kind of adapt for um, underuse of land. So this could be a situation where there's uh, adoption of a vacant property next door um, and lot sizes may grow in that situation. So within each of these uh, descriptions, you may have identified that there are some impacts on what could happen uh, to vulnerable households and where they could live. Uh, in this example, I'm showing the difference of each kind of impact based on, as compared to the business as usual scenario. Um, so in areas where it kind of has the red warning triangle, 
there's a greater risk or a higher need than the BAU, and places where there's a green check mark, there's a little bit lower of a need or a risk compared to the BAU. Um, so in each of these scenarios, there are things to be concerned about, and there are things that we wouldn't be concerned about. Uh, I think as regional planners, it's our job to prepare for any of these scenarios, uh, and so all of these impacts on vulnerable households and where they have the option to live are important to consider. Um, it's just good to note ahead of time uh, where we see the greatest risk for some of these things. So in a high compact scenario, we might see a higher uh, propensity for displacement and gentrification, whereas on the opposite side of the spectrum in a low and dispersed scenario, energy costs for low income households might uh, drive their decision making and where they can live. Question. Yeah. For, can you talk about how you just differentiate between displacement and gentrification? Like, what is the difference between those two in the way that this language was created? Yeah. Because I hear different. That's a good question. I, I hear different people use different things, or they use them interchangeably, mm -hmm. or like in St. Paul, we generally mostly say displacement because that's what we're really trying to get at is who's being actually like priced out of the community, whereas gentrification is often used in a nebulous way. So just for sake of understanding, I'm not like. I just want to understand the terminology as you use it. What, What's the thinking behind that? Yeah, one of the ways that I differentiate between the two is that displacement happens to people. People are forced to move kind of in the way that you just explained it, uh, Member Jalali Nelson, and gentrification happens to communities, um, places where there's a loss of community or a loss of feeling in a space, a loss of connection to space. So displacement would be like, individual families can no longer afford to live here. Gentrification is like when that's happening at scale and the nature and sort of like historic or, or everyday character the gets like erased like and replaced, it's gentrification. That's a super helpful <laughs> distinction in terms of how you're using that and I appreciate you just taking a second to unpack yeah. that. Thank you. Any other questions on this slide before I keep going? Keep going. Great. So now we're gonna jump into um, our big policy lever, starting with the need, the allocation of need. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about how we're doing it in the current decade. Um, you'll also note at the top of this slide, if you're in EY, uh, that scenarios used to calculate the 2040 need. Most of the time when we're talking about scenario planning, we look out to 2050. When we talk about housing policy, we only look out one decade because the ask of communities is pretty large with housing policy, and we want to be sure that we're using the most up-to-date um, forecasts in order to make that ask of communities. So our current method of need calculation is based on the household growth for each city and township. So all of the things that Dennis and Todd and Barish have explained to you that go into modeling are included in getting to that household number. Um, so we're starting from a pretty well-defined and dense calculation. And the changes that we're making to need are just to adjust this for things that aren't included within that calculation already. Need is a number of affordable units needed for these households that have low incomes. So this is only based on the growth of each community. This does not take into consideration how many, community, how many households within a community are already cost burdened or having just trouble finding somewhere to live. So this is, uh, in this decade, we broke it out into three bands of affordability, 30% of AMI, area median income, and below, 31 to 50% of area median income, and 51 to 80% of area median income. Um, just as a kind of like benchmark for this, uh, this, uh, earlier this week, HUD released income limits which help us calculate area median income. And the area median income for a family of four, which is distinct in HUD's calculation from a household, a family of four, is $62,000 a year. That's 50% of area median income. So I apologize it's not on the slide, but this is kind of breaking news. Um, <clears throat> the adjustment factors that we use for the need are the mismatch of low-cost housing and low-wage jobs within a community. So this is kind of controlling for what you might think of as a bedroom community that um, has some low-wage jobs there in commercial centers, at retail centers, 
um, but doesn't have a lot of uh, affordable places to live. Um, and also the opposite way around, where there's a place with a lot of low-wage jobs, um, but not, um, or I'm sorry, there's a place with a lot of low-wage housing, but not a lot of low-wage jobs. Um, the other adjustment factor that we use in calculating the need currently is existing low-cost housing that exists within the community. So that includes our naturally occurring affordable housing, which sometimes people term as NOAA, um, that has no public subsidy in it, and it also includes low-cost housing that is subsidized by government um, and kind of held in place uh, for a number of years. So when we used these same um, factors of how we calculate the need, uh, we found a couple of things. In all scenarios, there are always more low-income households. Um, nearly 65% of the growth in each scenario are for households at 50% of AMI in the world. Todd was telling you earlier that a large portion of that is with kind of the graying of our region. Um, the high dispersed and high compact scenarios um, have growth of about 150,000 new households in our region uh, through 2040, and 70% of those are at 50% of AMI and below. So this shows you the difference um, within each community designation grouping. We kind of simplified this because otherwise it would be maybe too many numbers. Showing you the difference from the business as usual um, between high compact and high dispersed scenarios. So the business as usual reflects essentially what our current affordable housing need share is across urban, suburban, and rural communities. Um, in the high and compact scenario, the urban value jumps uh, up to over 53%, um, and the suburban value falls down to 44%, um, with that plus 11 and minus 10%, and those are percentage points. So you can calculate just looking kind of across this table. Um, so in the high compact scenario, it more or less just flips the business as usual between urban and suburban. Um, and rural has, uh, across the region, a lower impact, but for the size of uh, the need that it currently has, a loss of about 30%. Um, in the most kind of dramatic uh, is in the high dispersed scenario, where we see a large flip, where over 80% of uh, low-income households uh, and the need would be in suburban communities. And I'm not really placing a value on any of this, but change from our current, um, from our current need share across the region would involve a, a change in learning curve. Um, it, it would mean that city staff uh, quickly would need to adapt um, to learning how to build at scale affordable housing for their communities. Now getting kind of into land guided for affordable housing, our other tool. At the bottom of this slide, you'll see a snippet directly from statute that asks the, uh, the council to ask of each city in the region to use land use planning to promote the availability of land for the development of low and moderate income housing. This was written in the early 70s when most of the region was greenfield development. Uh, we're in a different stage of development now as a region. And we've written a, a kind of like policy statement that takes up most of this slide that describes how we look at each comprehensive plan and comprehensive plan amendment to make sure that it's consistent with regional housing policy for guiding enough land for the development of low and moderate income housing. So what we currently ask ourselves when we read this is in the 2021 to 2030 decade, so our current planning decade, does each city and township with sewer service growth guide enough acres of land at high enough minimum densities that could develop or redevelop so that hypothetically, and I put that one in italics because it's kind of like, we all know there's not enough support for affordable housing to actually build this much, so that they could hypothetically build enough affordable housing for the number of low-income households the need expected in each community. 
So I decided to pull out an example, a recent example, <clears throat> of a community that built both attached and detached housing um, in the same year um, in about the same location within the community. Um, both of these, I think, are excellent projects worthy of funding. And they both got funding from many different sources. I think notably the attached housing project, which serves um, formerly homeless youth that has 18 efficiency units and a two-story walk-up on the left, uh, it doesn't use low-income housing tax credits. That's incredibly rare for new affordable housing um, built in our region, especially for attached housing. The detached housing project that happened in the same year uh, in downtown Chaska was on the site of a uh, building that was irredeemable. Um, and they decided to work with the Carver County Community Land Trust, CLT is short for Community Land Trust. And that means that when these homes are built, uh, the home is sold to the homeowner, but the land is kept in trust so that the housing is affordable for the deed restriction of 99 years, but in, in general, it's affordable in perpetuity. Um, I think the work that is happening in Carver County is pretty amazing. I think the work in community land trusts is great. Uh, the costs for each of these projects per unit are dramatically different. Um, and yes, they're different products and they serve different needs. The attached housing model for formerly homeless youth is rental. The detached housing um, single family units are long term affordable housing for home ownership. Um, when we think about the previous policy statement and what we can do in our region and the italics of hypothetically, we're thinking about how can we realistically meet the needs of low income families in our region. And with a price differential of those two things, that's why within Land Guided for Affordable Housing, we focus on minimum densities. And that concludes my presentation. Questions, comments? I still want to get at that 65 or 70% of the people would be below 50% of median income. That seems really, really high. He said some of it is from old people, but uh, old people and young people at low incomes need drastically different housing. But just the idea that most of the people that would be moving here for the next extended <clears throat> period of time would be people wanting essentially subsidized housing. People who need subsidized housing, yeah. And it's not only people who move here, and correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, or somebody who's better at senior training for us than I am, but it, it's, it's newly created households. So people moving out on their own for the first time um, or separating from their current family for whatever reason. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Did they ever look at, so I know from personal experience, um, I had a rental unit and my renters didn't pay rent uh, for three years and I couldn't kick them out of the house. I couldn't, uh, I had to go fix everything that broke um, and they could up until they left but they could have stayed in there for another year without paying rent under the um, under the state's policy on renters. They ever think about like the unintended consequences of some of the policies on perhaps why we don't have like a lot of rental places is because it's not uh, it's some it's not financially viable. It's it's a challenging. Uh, model for the people who own rental property when we have just in, the, in this case scenario my own situation I could have conceptually not received rent for four years and uh, I think that's a, it's it, it's a, it's another situation where some of the low-income housing issue is self-induced and then they try to band-aid by forcing towns like mine 
to increase their affordable housing, but they don't look at what might have caused it in the, some of the problems in the first place. Like this is a almost draconian where they say, you have to do this instead of looking at some of the state policies that caused the problem in the first place, like the rental example, not paying rent for four years and getting a pass. What, what, so under state law, like you can evict someone for non-payment of rent. So how no, is that, can. what happened in your situation? I'm Could, just confused. It was just, it, during, uh, during COVID, I, I could not evict my renters, period. Yeah, uh, during the eviction moratorium, but that didn't go on After for that years. too, yeah, it did. If they have a pending application, but that rule also expired and they reinstated it. I guess I'm just, con I'm, I'm confused about your scenario. We don't have to keep belaboring it, but. Yeah. It just seems like that both, I don't understand how that connects to the policy conclusion that you drew. Like, what policy led to the outcome that you're getting from that? There's a, there's a problem with having affordable housing. Part of the problem is when um, rental law is so tight and some of the other laws are so tight, they disallow people from even getting into the rental business or building rental properties. If you would have built a rental property three years ago, you potentially could have built a rental property and not got paid rent or not received rent payments for three years. Nobody's going to enter that, that, that policy will scar people from building rental units. Roseville, we built 600 rental units over the last three years. No more than that. And they're 100% occupied virtually. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that conclusion but is everybody, holds water. Was everybody paying the rent? Did it go well? I, I, can, I have a client that I just spoke with yesterday. It was in tears because she had somebody that moved in to her rental property and started COVID, has not paid it a penny for rent, still in the house, and she can't evict them. She doesn't want to. And she's an older lady. So, so there, there is the potential that difficulties in how it's handled is making is keeping people from getting into that sort of work. Makes it unless it's and like you see a lot of development. And as I see, it, they call it affordable housing, but it's it's upscale housing for rental property, and that's where a lot of the, to me that's where a lot of the stuff down in the downtown area is going, and and it's, and it's just the opposite of what it should be going. And, but I think to, to your point, um, I think that's part of the problem. Just some of the, the laws and regulations that are in place are made, are just, in, are just uh, um, not encouraging people to build rental, rental property. There's no value in it. I, with, um, Madam Chair, I think that where I'm kind of hearing and coming from is we have kind of the same growth in Shakopee with the units that are put in. But they're usually by larger corporations and that can absorb that kind of um, loss where if you're the smaller mom and pop trying to rent those those um, units or even trying to build them to invest, it's a little harder to do that. Mm -hmm. That's where I see that mix, mismatch. And I, I see a big fluctuation in the amount of rental housing that's available in my single family neighborhood depending on what the market is like, like when there yeah. was a downturn and people couldn't sell their houses, a lot of them went to rental, <clears> then they went back to owner-occupied. I've got two in my neighborhood right now that are owned by single people and they rent out all the bedrooms to their friends so that you know, a whole bunch of people have affordable housing. So there's there's a, a give and take in the overall market too, but I'm still blown away by that huge number of the new households being yeah. 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 I, 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 I concur. I think that seems pretty excessive. I don't know if this is because of this older populations that you're taking into the, that demographic, that cohort. Um, I don't know if that's true. That's one of the things that I, I had questioned. Can we get information about what it was in previous forecasts? What the income distribution was in previous forecasts? I'm trying to remember in the housing policy plan. I'm not expecting you to remember it off the top of your head. I'm sure I'll, 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 look into, I'll, I'll look into whether we have that from, from 10 years ago. 
not sure that we published anything about it. I think the need was 40% of total growth. I, I'm pretty sure that the need was about 40% of total growth for this current decade. But that was all the way up to 80% of AMI. Yeah, all the way up to 80%. And you're talking 50%, which is... Can I ask a clarifying question? I think this goes to both conversations that we had today. Is when you're talking 65, are you separating out the people who are still working from the people who are actually retired? Or do you not have a number for that? Because I've got employees working until 70, so where is that income coming from? And then, there, to an additional to that, even the retirees that are getting their investment income have income, but is that counting towards what this percentage is? Well, and the, the other part would be assets, because if you sold a home and moved here and you're old and you've got several yep. hundred thousand dollars to invest in housing, then you're not part of that demographic that needs affordable housing. What's your um, income to people? Madam Chair and Member Boko, I, I think uh, I mean, people are, are aware that about two thirds of working age adults in the Twin Cities uh, are employed. When you get above the age of 65, that, that participation rate, yes, there are still people employed, but the participation rate drops into about the 15 to 20 percent range. So, yes, there are, there are some senior citizens still working, but there's 80, 80 or 85% who are, are not working. So they may have they may have post-retirement income, but that post-retirement income uh, might very likely not be near what they were earning previously. They might even, they might uh, we might have people who are, are millionaires, but their post-retirement income drops to, let's say, $50,000. Do we now consider them low income? <laughs> I, I think we, we, will, we will have a, a large number of senior citizens who are, are in that boat. We may need to make some distinctions um, about what low income means in that case. Okay. Is that fair to, to you, Hillary? Okay. <laughs> okay, so Dan and then we Just very quickly, though, I think there was just reporting recently on just a tremendous percentage of people in this country who have virtually no retirement savings. Yes. yes. And so, yes, there are people still working, and part of that might be that they don't have a lot of savings. Um, you know, but there's a significant portion of our population that really doesn't have much to live on once they get past a certain age. And they're borrowing against that savings that they do have, which is what I see. A lot. So when you're looking at things in the aggregate, you have to think about the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Um, I would just draw out like two things this makes me think about. One is just the community land trust model as something that I think needs to be looked at and scaled up and figuring out how to like foster community ownership of the land in all the ways that we can. That's something that we do in St. Paul. We have the Rondo Land Trust, which is named the Rondo Land Trust, but it actually has land like kind of throughout the city. And we're putting more funding into that, and I think it's important for both like supporting first time and like continued home ownership, but then also helping, you know, the cost of that home ownership and like the relative hurdles remain a lot lower. And then the other is just sort of getting at the piece that you were just talking about, Dan, like people's wages not keeping up with the cost of housing. And I am always looking at the housing conversation on like the housing cost side, like what are rents and what's the price per unit to create this housing and all these different, but but on, there's those inputs and then there's just the fact that like the people in the market, the people, the people in our communities trying to just like afford rent and live their lives and have jobs, like their wages are so low compared to what they need to be making to actually just exist in the society we live in. And so there's a huge like piece of this conversation that's just why are wages low? What do we need to do in like the job sector to create more roles for people? Um, the way technology is replacing people's jobs, sorry, technology is replacing people's jobs. Like, there's all these pieces to that that are, like, hugely complex. And so even with this full court press on, like, the side to bring down the cost of housing or, like, make housing more attainable, there's this huge missing piece on the other side that's just people will work so much harder for so much less money today. And it's a huge problem, and it's something that feels very hard to solve. So I think that where that can be pulled out in any recommendations we're coming up with, I think that would be important to give direction to like state and federal decision makers who are well positioned to address a lot of that. 
just some additional stats. To plug some other work we've been doing, when we got the income limits from HUD, uh, thank you, Chad. <laughs> when we got the income limits from HUD, we calculated the new area needed incomes for this year. Um, we posted a survey uh, that asked about uh, affordability limits in general, um, and you guys might find it interesting um, to provide your feedback on that. Um, it's live on our website on our affordability limits page on the Eighth Little Community Act. Okay, we'll have to check that out. We are getting right at the six o'clock hour. Um, thank you, Hillary, and I'm sorry, I forgot your name, Dennis. Yes, yes. For your and Paris, I'm sorry. <laughs> for your presentations, do you guys have any other final comments, Dan? Just a, a, an appreciation because at, at the end of one of our last discussions about the scenario planning, I think one of the things that I specifically asked for was understanding better how the different scenarios affect are affected by or affect policy decisions. And so this, I think, this you know presentation was pretty much seemed to be directly in response to that. Uh, so I very much appreciate that, and I think it, it does illustrate how. You know, what this was basically looking at was, okay, you know, Todd talked a lot about sort of the business as usual model in the first presentation, and this was to say, well, we don't know for sure that growth is going to be exactly 657,000 people. It could be higher than that. That's the high growth that was in all these presentations, and it could be lower than that. That was the low growth, and there were assumptions that were explained in previous presentations about that, but it really does help, and then it could be all in the center or more dispersed. Those are, so those are the four different scenarios, just to kind of put the big picture together. But you can see then, you know, if you start looking at policies to impact whether the growth is more dispersed or more uh, compact, or vice versa, that's how you can start to see some of the impact. So I really do appreciate that. I just wanted to express those things. And it's my understanding that Todd's information presents a less than business as usual because it's lower than what we thought it was going to be originally. Correct. Uh, yeah, Madam, Madam Chair, the business as usual was the 2019, circa 2019 regional forecast, and it is, we have been there. trending downward. Mm -hmm. um, so we're already looking at low yes. growth, we, we, the, the high growth scenarios seem increasingly unlikely. Right. Good. Things could change. But yeah, okay. Thank you everybody for, for being yes, here. Thank you everyone. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. If anybody needs a, a badge down to the secret door to the parking ramp. The secret